Good afternoon or good morning to you all, wherever you may be in the world. This is Lillian, and this is another live talk show with an amazing lady. I am so passionate about our speaker of today, our guest of today. I have a feeling, or I just keep connecting to her. I have a feeling many of us from Africa, all the business women in Africa, need somebody like this. So before I say anything else, let's kick off this conversation and let's talk about our subject of discussion today. Today, we are going to be talking about the importance of business visibility. What is business visibility? Are we doing enough to be visible in our business? Let's set, set the stage with our quote of the day, which is cultivate visibility because attention is currency. And this quote is from Chris Brogan. Today, we have a sister, a reference, and a mentor all the way from Canada by name, Eleanor Burton. Eleanor, how are you today? I am doing just great. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. As I said earlier on, we need you in Africa. I don't know how this is going to happen, but we need you. I have so much admiration for your work. I have so much admiration for your simplicity that it's this is the contrast that we need in Africa. In women in Africa, we tend to say things like, oh, just give me, just in this kind of rush. And at the end of the day, we get nothing out of it. But when I watch you over and over on your live streams, when I watch you over and over in your, when I listen to you in your webinars, I'm like, this is it. You can get what you want, seeing it and show up in a different way. So I already have a live viewer. And many people will be thinking, so who is she? Who is Eleanor? Who is she? Okay, let me give you her biography. <laughs> Eleanor is an award-winning journalist and podcast host, keynote speaker, and women's leadership development mentor. She serves as chair of the Visiting Women's Executive Exchange Program at the Yale University of Management. In 2017, she won the prestigious profile in diversity award worth watching, award for her work promoting diversity and inclusion. Eleanor joins previous recipient of this award, including General Motors CEO Mary Barra, Xerox CEO Ursula Burns, advocate actress Gina Davies, and many other women from diverse industries and backgrounds, driving meaningful change in parity and gender equality. She has been privileged to serve some of the country's most recognized women leaders, including Alan Dickinson, who is the star of CBC's hit show Dragon and Dean, Dragon Dean's and former, former Canadian First Lady Margaret Trudeau. In 2017, she was a finalist for one of Canada's most prestigious literature award, the National Business Book Award, for her collaboration with former Depot Canada CEO, Annette Vacheren on Bet on Me, a guide to succeeding in business and life. And in 2017, she is a finalist for a National Magazine Award for her column on women's leadership, the X Factor. Through her keynotes, life events, and training programs, Ellen helps ambitious professional women and business owners develop their confidence, presence, political savvy, and influence the need to smash glass ceilings and take their seats at the tables where the big deals and big decisions are made. I'm so I'm so proud to be living in an era with, with a woman like you. I'm so proud to be talking to you, and I'm so proud to be a vessel to other women through you. So, Eleanor, welcome to the show, and thank you again once more for accepting our invitation. How are you today? 
I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And, you know, it's wonderful to be here. And I hope that what, you know, what we talk about over the course of our conversation is going to be useful and valuable to the women who are listening. I think so. I think so. So you are the queen of business visibility. When I speak of visibility, I, when I just think of the, of how visible I can, you know, invest in myself, how can I go visible? What should I do to be visible? You come to mind. So please help me correct the mistakes I am making or many women are making. What is business visibility? Business visibility comes down to your willingness to be seen uh, strategically and the skill with which you are able to put yourself out there. So it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that you need to be an Instagram star or a social media star. What it does mean is that you are able to ensure that your message is seen and heard by the right people in a strategic way that supports your career development and your business growth. Great. So uh, this is quite complex because you've just used one word which did not even cross my mind, the willingness to be seen and heard to the right audience. Well, if I am studying business, there is that willingness, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I think that there are many people who feel as long as I know what to say, then I'm willing to be visible. And that's true. Certainly when you know your message and you know how to confidently articulate your value in the market or you have a very clear and simple elevator pitch that you can use to describe what you do and the value you bring, that can absolutely make you give you a degree of confidence when it comes to being seen. However, what I have noticed in working with very brilliant women who are leaders inside organizations and also women who are building their own businesses is that sometimes they would have a great message, yet they still held back from perhaps marketing their business effectively, from saying yes to speaking opportunities. So I realized that it wasn't just the skill, the technical skill of being able to share a great message. It was also the um, the willingness, you know, to to share that message, the will willingness to be vulnerable. Great, thank you so much. We have Rita online. Rita is a business coach and she's based in Holland. Thank you so much, Rita, for joining us. Please ask your questions and uh, let Elena know uh, what some of your concerns or your difficulties that some difficulties that you have. Uh, on your business visibility. Are you visible? Are you doing enough? What's stopping you from being visible? So, Eleanor, how did you come to this? What did you find this passion of helping women become visible? It was actually quite by accident. I spent the first part of my career I had a communications consulting business. And so I did a lot of work behind the scenes with CEOs, with politicians, with nonprofit leaders, with government agencies, helping them craft great communication strategies, um, speeches, that kind of thing. So I was very much a behind the scenes advisor. And what I found, you know, many of those leaders asked me to start doing more work with their teams. So I started doing more sort of communications development, leadership development. And at this point, I noticed that um, that many of those, particular, in particular women around the table, needed to, um, they maybe needed some more mentorship or they wanted to take what I was teaching them further. So they wanted to kind of work with me privately and they wanted to, um, they wondered, did I have courses or programs that they could take? So I started to do that work. And, and what I realized was that my value was not only in advising people behind the scenes, but the more I sort of stepped up and shared the message that I had, the more I was able to impact people. And so I started to do that. I started to, you know, rather than just, you know, teaching a leadership team, I started saying yes to speaking opportunities. And after, you know, I did a speaking opportunity, people would come and thank me, you know, and say something you said 
had a big impact on me as an example. And so I realized that my, in order to have the impact I was capable of, I needed to be willing to get out there and be seen. Now, in my mother's culture, my mother's from the Fiji Islands, in my mother's culture, um, it, being very visible is, is not something, is not a cultural practice. And so growing up, you know, I, I definitely had this sort of cultural teaching that being out there, sharing your message, um, that it was, I had to sort of work through that and make peace with, um, with my own willingness to be visible, if you will. So that's really how I came to, to do this work and came to, you know, really understand the, the true power of being visible. First, it was that there was a pull from the market. And then I felt the internal the internal um, constraints that I had to work through and that I knew so many other women had to work through as well. That's amazing. It's the same case for women in Africa. Mm. We are not allowed to You're supposed to, you know, somehow shy away, somehow take your the back seat. Even if you are the, you know, the backbone, you are, the most important part of a household, you're not allowed. That's mm. how the culture is. And when girls like me woke up and started speaking, they were like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, 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 you can't. <laughs> so that's why I say, I mean, I, I can only imagine how many women in Africa are going through the same, or many girls that are going through the same difficulties. And that's why I keep mentioning women in Africa need you. It's mm -hmm. not a matter taking over is just saying, putting your point across a very different way. You have that elegance of doing that and you are just, you are just my reference on visibility. Yeah, thank you. As you know, visibility is also, it attracts, it exposes your business, but it also exposes you and it attracts all this attention towards you. And we women, we tend to, you know, we're not good in showing up, we're not, going, we're, not, we're not good in owning it. We tend to shy away. So as an expert, you've been working with people, uh, women on this visibility issue. What are some of the reasons that are holding us women back from being visible? Historically, you know, I mean, if you go back you know, even 10, 20, 30,000 years, really. Historically, it was actually quite dangerous for women to stand out, to to shake, um, to kind of rock the boat. Yes. Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, years and years ago, as a woman, we were very much dependent on our community to support us, particularly, you know, if something happened to our mate, let's say. So, you know, my mate is out hunting a mastodon, um, you know, dies in the hunt. Now myself and my family are very much dependent on the kindness and generosity of our community. And so for me to do anything to um, risk the displeasure of somebody in that, you know, in that community by standing out, by voicing a controversial opinion, that could literally mean life or death for myself and for my children. So historically, you know, it was actually very dangerous for women to stand out in that way, to um, to rock the boat, to voice controversial opinions, and so on. So I think that's one. Today, we still have, as a as a world, a very conflicted relationship with women in power, and very often we imbue power or power really is visibility and voice. You know, if you think about the most powerful people in the world, yes, they have money, but they also are visible and they have a voice that's heard. And so as women, you know, we still, as, as a society, we still have a very conflicted relationship with women in power. So I think that's another thing um, that can that can absolutely be at play. And, you know, we are raised as women to be people pleasing, to make people happy. And I think those are three factors that can make it very difficult or that we need to work through or that we need to be conscious of when it comes to being willing, willing to be seen and heard and share, you know, our insight and contribution with the world. Yeah, yeah. 
that's amazing. But I mean, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. So are we women doing enough to step up our game? Are we doing enough to even break this glass ceiling? As you, <laughs> you put it. We are working so hard. You know, when it comes to breaking the glass ceiling, I always think about sort of the two the two forces. There are things that we, you know, as individual women can do. And there are also things that um, that the system needs to do. So when I talk about what we as women can do, I just always want to be very clear that there is we are working inside um, what could be described as a broken system. There's lots of gender bias. There are policies. There are, you know, cultural norms, which, um, which you as the individual woman can actually change. That said, are we doing enough? I think that, like, when I think about the clients that I'm working with, um, I see a group of ambitious, well educated, um, you know, heart centered women who are out there, you know, working hard um, and and making a contribution. But what I also see is that sometimes we are working harder than we're working smart. So here's an example. You know, if you have a great coaching or consulting business and you do really great work on behalf of your clients, it's probably um, a good idea to make sure one thing that could really move your business forward is if you speak more. You know, if you get out there to different places and start doing some some keynote speaking, potentially, if you market your business more effectively. And that's where I start to see sometimes women may be reluctant to put themselves out there in that way. Wow. OK, that's hard. Finding speaking um, opportunities are not easy to find. And again, for the con continent of Africa, very, very few places. So how can this be breaking the scene? I'm using your words. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you repeat the question? I, how can how can women begin finding speaking opportunities? Exactly. Yeah. So there are a couple of different ways. So one is absolutely to let people know and to start asking people about, you know, do you know of this is my topic and be and, and be as specific as you can in your topic. Do you know of any organizations who are looking for some great training or, um, you know, a learning opportunity about this? So that's definitely one. Um, another way that you can, you know, work on getting speaking opportunities is to create them yourself. Um, and that's definitely something that I do. So we will put on our own events and invite people to our own events. Um, and so that's another great speaking opportunity. You know, you have you here with your show. This is a great speaking opportunity that you create your own platform. You invite other women onto your platform, but you are also sharing your wisdom as well. So I think that, you know, as women, we can tap into existing platforms to speak and and what's really important for us is to also create our own platforms and i see that rita has a comment here i can't read the whole thing yes. it looks okay. interesting well they had some comments rita said also as an entrepreneur for me was first a mindset limitation to be seen and heard yes absolutely and i can i can completely relate i mean i had the same thing i remember the first time that you know when i first started speaking when i first started doing interviews and that type of thing i um i would hear myself and just cringe <laughs> You know, not because it, I, I didn't think I was sharing valuable stuff. I just felt so uncomfortable seeing myself and hearing myself. Um, oh. and then I got over it, you know. Talk to me about it. Hearing my own voice is like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Who is, what is that? Who is that? Yeah. <laughs> we have another comment from Mark Robinson who says, sad thing is, is it also makes it hard in workplace when you observe or see a lot of females. I just saw a live video stream on Facebook Live and she basically hijacked an SEO group with no with nothing more than trying to look beautiful and okay. So what he's saying is that they're not adding value. But that's yeah, yeah, and and you know, and I think that's so it that's a great um 
you you want to you want to show up from a place of service always um, and add value. And you know what I would say the the trouble that I see more is that we have this huge world population, you know, um, and and obviously a massive population of women in Africa and and African women in other parts of the world who have a lot of value to add and have a lot to contribute and are doing so. Yeah. Okay, uh, before we continue with the next question, I, I'm so grateful to all those who are alive, and I'm going to ask Mark a question. I hope we look beautiful, and I hope we're adding value. <laughs> are we adding value, and do we look beautiful? Please, you need to just let us know in the comment. Mark Robinson, we are waiting for your reply. <laughs> are we just trying to look beautiful, or do we have some value here for you? And just comment below and um, Rita has a comment as well live streaming is my practice and helped me to overcome it ah excellent yeah that's a great I mean it and it's never been easier you know it's never been easier to to begin the practice of being visible with the technology that we have today Instagram stories Facebook lives Facebook stories podcasting. Um, there's so many opportunities to get out there. LinkedIn now offers video. So it's really, yeah, it's, it's, there's so many opportunities to get out there and, and add value. Great. And this is a great, I know, I adore you, Mark, already. He's <laughs> a very, very politically savvy, Mark, very politically savvy. <laughs> Thank you for all the encouragement. You know, when you comment like this, then maybe we'll have a little bit more courage to come and give more value. And you know, it's a process. Live stream is a process. You need to first get the confidence in doing it and the willingness, as you say, to come up every day and you will, you will, you get better day mm -hmm. after day. So mm -hmm. it's not from one day to the next. You know, another, another tip that I want to offer people. So I work with women entrepreneurs and, and one of the things that I encourage them to do is to launch a podcast. And I remember one of, one of the women inside this group said uh, that she was a guest on a podcast and she listened back to her interview and she, she couldn't stand hearing herself. All she, when she heard the interview, all she heard were all the things that she didn't say or all the moments when she said, um, or, uh, and because of that, she didn't want to promote this interview or share it more widely. And on the one hand, I, I totally understand we want to put our best foot forward and to present ourselves as professionally as we can. And that makes perfect sense. On the other hand, what I have noticed is if I pay too much attention to what I sound like or what I look like, it can really kick off this other thing. And that is the perfectionism, you know, the, the perfectionism quality that I see in so many, uh, you know, high potential, high performing men and women, but particularly women. And so one of the tips that I offer people is when you are first beginning to get out there, whether it's podcasting or live streaming or speaking or, you know, being interviewed, don't do your best to lay track. And what I mean by that is build up a body of work, get used to it and don't judge yourself too harshly. Get out there and do it. Um, and don't go back and listen to every single episode right off the top, because that may cause you as you're a, a beginning live streamer, let's say it might cause you to actually stop because all you pick up and it's human nature. 50 good things happen to us in a day. One bad thing happens to us a day. What is the thing that we're most focused on? The one bad thing. So I would say that, you know, get out there, do it, do the best you can, but don't go back and listen to everything you're putting out there um, on an ongoing basis. You might get so focused on what's, what you're not doing well that you actually stop. So what I will do is I, you know, for, with our podcast, for instance, you know, I just podcast and then probably about once a month, I'll go back and listen to three episodes and I'll think about what three things could I improve on. And that's it. I don't go back and listen to every, my team does, but I'm not going back to listen to every single episode because if I did, I, you know, all, I, I just don't have the time or the energy to go back and, and, and pick at my flaws. Great. Uh, we have some amazing comments here. I'm happy about this. Uh, Max says it also has to be, to do with luck. 
he was raised more by women and they were divorced women and this had an impact on his confidence. Mm. And that's what do you have to say about that? Um Ah, you know that's that's interesting, and, and it's it's I've never um, I've never thought about it that way. Um, you know, here's here's something to think about. I think in all of us we have feminine and masculine in everybody, and here's you know Mark and everyone who's listening. Here's how I think about healthy feminine is innovation, creativity, nurturing, support, and in healthy masculine. I think about healthy masculine, we think about masculine, you know, um, uh, masculine energy as competitive, domineering, conquering. That's actually unhealthy masculine. Healthy masculine is protection, preservation, and backup. Okay, protection, preservation, and backup. And we all need both. You know, in order to be an entrepreneur, you need to be able to come up with great ideas, to innovate, you know, to generate community, to nurture your clients, that sort of healthy feminine, but you also need to protect your ideas, to protect your business, to back up that business. So I think, you know, as, as in response to Mark's question, I think it's about really embracing both the healthy feminine and the healthy masculine. And, you know, I see, you know, and I see lots of opportunities in a very healthy way to be protective in a healthy way to be to to provide in a healthy way and to provide provide that backup too great maggie says i had to accept my english accent this is an excellent point and it resonates with me it does resonate with me and many people in africa because we have dialects and we have languages and if you were from cameroon like me you had english and french and going through your biography i was thinking Toda, I was thinking in French, and I said, no, Toda, no. <laughs> and when you throw yourself out there and you're doing your live stream, you have to, it's like you have to think it. How do I say it? How do I pronounce? And this is holding us back. Just like Maggie is saying, uh, yes, she had to get, uh, you no, know, I said her English accent on live stream. Mm -hmm. How does that affect our visibility? It doesn't, it doesn't affect our visibility unless we let it. It doesn't affect our visibility unless we let it. You know, I think inside all of us is that person who, or there's an aspect, it's like the inner critic, you know, who wants to keep us small and very safe. And we all have it. And that voice will never disappear. What will change is just whether we, whether we choose to listen to it or not. So the inner critic is this omnipresent thing. It's sort of like a 10% off sale. You know, if you, if you walk down a, a main street, most shops, there's going to be a lot of shops that have some kind of sale, sale signs. Oh, we have a 10% off sale. We have a 50% off sale. You know, you see the sign. It doesn't mean you have to go and invest, you know, in every store where you see the sign. The same is true with that inner critic. So, it, you know, it's just going. Oh, you know, you didn't do this. You, you, maybe people won't be able to understand your accent. Oh, you know, it might be a little bit slower because you have to think in five because you know multiple languages and you're, you've got to figure out which one you're going to think in. You just can't invest too much in that critic, you know. And then the other thing that a mentor once told me that we waste a lot of time solving hypothetical problems. So when I'm working with my clients, my invitation to them is to create as many problems for yourself as you can. So here's an example. Let's take, you know, one of our guests here, Margie, who may have said in the beginning, my gosh, you know, I have this English accent and it might affect me as a live streamer. And obviously she's live streaming. And so it didn't affect her that much. But let's say it did in the beginning. The, oh, I, I wonder if people will be able to, to understand me. Well, create the problem that people can't understand you and then fix that problem, <laughs> you know? So, so, you know, we will hold back from live streaming because we're afraid people might not understand us. That's a hypothetical yes. problem that doesn't exist. Get on live stream, say your piece, actually have people not understand you now you've got a real problem and you and it's much easier to solve a real problem than a hypothetical problem 
Yes, yes. but if you go to those days of uh, Periscope, the very first live streaming, you remember uh, how people will really just say hurtful words? People will just insult you or say bad things or just call you like, some bad words. Do you know how many people have been broken by this kind of comments mm. and they will never show up again mm. because of that? So Maggie's point is, it's, I take it to heart as well because mm -hmm. that's improved. The live streaming has improved, but mm -hmm. okay, I want to take it from your and true. Your and, and I was using it as an example. You know, I was I was yeah. only using it as an example, but I think that the underlying thing is, you know, um, is to listen to your intention to take okay. action. You know, as you want to take, but to also deal with problems that are real, clear, and present. You know what I mean? Rather than holding back to avoid problems that you don't have yet. Okay, great. Yeah. So what you're, what you're saying is your mission is much more greater than that voice in your head critics that you see online. Mm. And you, like and you know what? I'm totally out there and, and don't, don't, I don't deal a lot with critics, with, with trolls, critics for yeah. sure. But it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been my experience. Good. So now to the I next question. What is the link between visibility and marketing? Mm. So uh, when you, in order to effectively market your business, mm -hmm. what we what we as entrepreneurs will sometimes underestimate is the number of times people need to hear our message before it actually sinks in. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, if you have a great offering, you must be out there consistently in front of your market uh, in order for them to really get, you know, in order for them to really get that, um, that you, oh yeah, you've got a new program launching or you have this service that can be offered. So I think that the link between visibility and marketing is that you know, you, you have to accept visibility because to really be out there to really kind of grow your business, it's important that people know what you offer. And typically mm -hmm. they need to hear multiple times. So if you're not comfortable being out there, you know, marketing your business, it may be hard for you to generate the kind of growth you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talking about this visibility and marketing, we are simply talking directly to our ideal clients. Mm -hmm. What we're sending messages out here to, to them. What are the key points or words we should be more conscious of so that we, we attract, first of all, these ID clients, we really mark, you know, make an impact mm. while we attract clients? I think about problems and promise. So, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about ideal clients and communicating with them, what I know to be true is that the more clearly... I can articulate um, the problems that they are experiencing with respect to the solution that I offer, the more likely they are to, um, to trust me, right? So if I can clearly articulate uh, the, the problems that they have, the challenges that they have, now they have, um, now, now they know, okay, this is a woman who understands me and I trust her, or I'm willing to listen a little bit more. So that's the first really being being very clear about the problems. And, you know, what we know about great CEOs of of some of the most successful companies is that they were always very market facing. So, for instance, Steve Jobs, the, the founder of Apple, uh, toward the end of his life and his tenure as CEO of that company, he spent most of his time talking to customers um, and he actually only really chaired one meeting a week. He only really participated in one meeting a week and it was a marketing meeting. Okay. So he really knew how important marketing was and being able to be market facing, understanding the problems that his customers had. Meg Whitman, um, the CEO of HP Enterprises, um, the only woman to be listed twice on Fortune, you know, Fortune's most powerful women in business list. Mm -hmm. She um, she continues to this day to actually cold call existing customers to learn more about the problems that they have 
have what works about their solution because she knows that her ability to be an effective communicator um, you know, for the company depends on her intimate knowledge of the problems that her customers have and the solutions that they want, right? So yeah, Andrew is saying clearly articulate their problems and the solution you bring to the table, absolutely. And so that's the problems part. The next part, and this is absolutely something that I think that sometimes as women we can struggle with, is to clearly articulate the promise of what we can do for people. I'll give you an example. I was speaking to somebody some time ago who was pitching investors and she she was pitching for a significant amount of money and she um, she was having some a bit of a crisis of confidence when it came to really describing the full promise of the solution that she had, the fullness of what it was going to do and the impact that it was going to have on customers, on society, on investors. She wasn't owning the promise. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that this is another thing that we need to do. You know, we need to be sure that we're articulating and communicating a, that we understand the problem, but owning the promise, having the guts and the courage to own the promise of what our, you know, our offering, the impact that it has on our clients. Great. And maybe this is a good point to Mark Robinson, who says, I actually left a PSC as one of their biggest store managers because they said I was spending too much time helping on the floor and they did not want me to do that. So were you really owning the promise, Mark? <laughs> Were you on the promise? Eleanor would like to know as we go on with the questions, would like to know if you did own the promise and how you did. So while we carry on to the next question is uh, now we've decided we, we have the intention, we've decided to be visible. What three tools can we start using today to be visible? So the first tool would be to never leave a meeting without having weighed in or contributed in some way. Huh. So the way that you do this um, might be different, you know, depending on your role and the inherent power in your position. So for instance, if you are a CEO or you are a team leader, what you may find that you need to do is weigh in last in a meeting. So you are, are being visible, you are sharing what you think, but you may need to weigh in last so that your opinion doesn't overly influence your team. You know, one of the biggest challenges that leaders have is getting accurate and ongoing information from people around them and not just having people tell them what they think they want to hear. Um, but for everyone else, you know, especially for the quiet, more retiring types, one of the things that I'll often challenge them to do is to actually experiment now and then with being the first person to weigh in. It's really important that your voice is heard. You know, I can remember this great um, this this great interview with Madeleine Albright, who's a former U.S. Secretary of State. And she talks about, you know, um, getting when she was UN, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, she shows up at her first meeting and she tells herself, well, I'm just going to be I'm just going to listen and get the lay of the land and figure out who's who and what's what. And I'll weigh in the next meeting. And she walks mm -hmm. into the room and it's not her name at the table. It says the placard at her seat says United States. And she realized that if she didn't speak, the voice of the United States would have been silent at that meeting. Well, the same is true for you. You know, if you are not speaking up around a table, your voice has been silent and your ability to make a contribution and an impression has been lost. So that's the first one. Really make sure that you speak up um, at every uh, at every single meeting. I think another thing that's really important for women entrepreneurs and, and women in business is to have a speaking topic, like have a brief signature talk that you can use that's going to help you build your business and help you advance your career. To me, that's a very foundational ingredient um, of visibility and really important. And then finally, surround yourself with women who are also willing to be visible. You know, uh, surround yourself with those women who are going to be comfortable with your visibility and are going to hold space and support the person that you are becoming in addition to the person who you are. Oh dear. That's amazing. I did not think of that. Never leave a meeting without making a that's That's amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. That's really helpful. 
Now, how can, how do you work with your client? I mean, for example, somebody like me, I do Facebook lives, I interview people, preparing for events. And how can you give us a breakdown on how you can help somebody like me be more visible and break that glass ceiling? Mm. So, you know, a lot of the work that we do is, is, is in groups. And so I fully believe, you know, there's a, there's an expression, it's a Lakota expression that healing happens in the spaces between people, you know, it, it happens in relationships. So what I like to do is bring together brilliant groups of women, um, take them through a curriculum typically that's designed to help them be more visible. Um, and, and to, you know, have these, I call them group coaching circles. So, you know, what we'll often do, you know, in our program, so we have a, an eight week program, it's called the Leadership Lab. We have a year long program called the Incubator. And in each of those programs, we'll bring together cohorts of brilliant women. We take them through the curriculum, but we will also have um, weekly 90 minute group coaching calls. And so you may be experiencing a challenge, you know, Lillian, which, you know, you would receive some group coaching around. But while you get a lot of benefit from the coaching that you get, the other women who are listening, they may hear you say something and learn and gain insight into their own situation in a different way. So that's typically, you know, in terms of, of the, the nitty gritty of how we work together. And I have seen tremendous gains, you know, tremendous gains that we can make as women working in that kind of collaborative, supportive environment. So that's really the first part. And really what it comes down to is the inner game, sort of the, yes. the willingness, the, yes. um, the skill. So developing that powerful signature talk, you know, developing um, your thought leader platform. That's kind of the mm -hmm. second part. Um, and then the, the third aspect, the third aspect of this that, that we don't, you know, often talk about is that kind of, uh, bold outreach. You know, how are you, you, you've got the material, you've got that inner game, and how are you getting it out into the world consistently? Good, great. Mm. I know we have live viewers from the UK, Netherlands. Um, Maggie, please do comment below in the, just comment below so we can know where you're watching this live stream from. We have people from Africa. And to all the replay viewers, please ask your questions. I'm sure Eleanor will answer them. And give us your feedback. How you, where you stand with your visibility and where you want to see yourself in 2018. Can Eleanor help you? What do you need as support to move your business forward? Remember, we're here to support you. You are not alone. So let us know how we could be of service to you. We have yeah, people from the UK, Netherlands, Africa. We would like to know how you feel about your visibility. What's holding you back? Comment below and please share this video with your family and friends. You never know. Someone needs to hear this story today to give them the courage to start or be live streaming or start speaking. Just say something at the end of the meeting. Don't leave the meeting without making a point. That's the one tip that stands out for me. Eleanor, can visibility lead to financial freedom and how? Mm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, I, um, I really had to make my reckoning with visibility as an entrepreneur because I had created, you know, I'd created a, a great platform, a good team, incredible programs, and we were doing well. But I knew that there was this next level of impact that I could have. And I, I really felt like we were a best kept secret. And what I realized is that I was holding myself back from getting out there more. I was holding myself back from being visible. And so I made a pact with myself that I wasn't gonna do that anymore. And what we saw was a real increase in leads, um, in sales, in our business. And so absolutely there is a link between, or there certainly can be a link between visibility and financial freedom, particularly you know, in the entrepreneurial space because it means more, probably more effective marketing um, and more exposure and sales. 
inside mm -hmm. a corporate setting, it means, you know, inside a corporate setting, it's you have to understand it's not just what you know, it's who knows what you know. Um, and so visibility is absolutely important there in terms of unlocking promotion. So yeah, clear link. Great. And Matt has a question for us. Do you record those sessions to play back for the people you're helping? I think that's a question for you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We have, we can have this as uh, we have it on our, um, we we'll send it to our YouTube channels. We also have it on our website. So it's, we never bring down any video, but if people need help, like we are now helping a lady in Kenya, we call her by Facebook or by Skype to help them directly. So that's how we get in contact with those women. That's how, if, you, if you check our Facebook Live, there is a lady who is creating shoes in Kenya. We are in contact with her and we hope to be really, we hope to help her business move forward in 2018. Yes, we do contact them not only through videos or playback, we speak to them in person. Eleanor, the next question now is what does financial free freedom mean to you? I mean, when you've done your work, you've been visible, increased your sales, what does that financial freedom mean to you? Uh -huh. So I, I say to my clients that cash flow is king and cash reserves are queen. So um, to me, uh, to me, financial freedom means having a system that generates um, healthy cash flow, both inside your business and inside your life. You know, and so that as an entrepreneur, it takes work to create that system so that you have a business that is continuing to generate revenue, even though you might be on holiday or perhaps you need to take some personal time. So to me, that's financial freedom. It's about that structure. Um, and I remember, you know, some time ago reading that when Bill Gates was CEO of Microsoft, he insisted that the company have 12 months of operating expenses, a 12 month operating expenses cash reserve in the bank. Now, um, I, I thought that was, you know, I remember reading it and thinking the first thing I felt was freedom. Imagine yes. having 12 months of business operating expenses banked as a cash reserve and the freedom that that would give you as an entrepreneur. So to me, that is, you know, do I need 12? Maybe not. But, you know, having like a six month cash six reserve months. of operating expenses for your business. And, you know, personally, to me, that's freedom, flow and reserves. Great. Great. That's amazing. So as we wrap up, what one solid advice can you give to any woman who is thinking 2018 is here to have cash flow and reserve? <laughs> yeah. See, I'm a good, I'm a good student. I'm lazy. <laughs> yes. Funds, flow, and reserve. So she said. So I'm doing. What one solid advice can you give her as she tries to master the art of business visibility? To, on a very deep level, to become at peace with being uncomfortable <laughs> to be, to be un, you know, at peace with being uncomfortable because so often, you know, being visible is about, it, it puts us into uncomfortable situations. You know, um, you're doing an interview. You might not know what people are going to ask you. You might be taking on a new challenge. You might be voicing a potentially controversial opinion um, inside a meeting. And all of those things require courage. And in the moment, courage doesn't feel great. In the moment that you're practicing courage, it usually feels really uncomfortable. And so I think really learning to relax in that discomfort. You know, it's like I remember when I first started doing yoga and I started doing this, you know, the position downward dog. And I remember the, the instructor said, this is your resting position. And <laughs> And it's hard, <laughs> like downward dog. It's not an like easy, it's, no, I'm not, to me, resting was lying down, you know, resting was not doing downward dog. But as I got used to practicing yoga, it became a more relaxed, I got what she meant. I could, I learned how to rest, you know, in downward dog. And so I think it's learning how to rest 
even though you may be uncomfortable or outside your comfort zone. If you want to achieve great things in 2018 and you want to love or enjoy the process of that growth, because, you know, it's not about the results, not really. It's about the process and it's of who you become en route to achieving those results. That's the insight that I would share. Great. Thank you so much. You are so has a question for me. Lillian, what about online? The funny thing for me, I see smart, in, intelligent women in your country. But I do not see many that work online. Is that due to internet access or China? Well, there are so many reasons I could give you, but the most frequent reasons are it's not shyness, it's not the internet connection, it's the culture. Mm. The culture is so backwards, I would say, or is so unforgiving for we to show up that it's not easy for women to really own it and just say, I'll do it. It's something which is not yet accepted that women show up in public and to make it work on the internet when everybody around the world can see you. So the culture is holding women back the time, if you know many African women, they do not have that the luxury of time of going online. They're busy with so many other things and they simply do not exist for themselves. The third reason is the means. Not believe it, how internet connection is cheap abroad. For the African women, it's not that cheap. So you have very few women who have the luxury of the funds to go online, the time, and the courage to say, you know, this is my life and I'll do it anyway. And that's why I'm coming up. That's why I'm putting myself up here to tell them, you can. You've got just one life, you can. And that decision is yours because if you start making those changes, even if you, that's why some of my live stream, I do them late at night because that's when they finish the chores of the day and they have that time to themselves. And slowly, I believe you will see more and more women coming up, but someone has to really go get them, really encourage them to be themselves. That's why our wife is here. We really want to challenge the status quo for their economic advancement because they have the knowledge, they've got the talent, they're smart, they're intelligent, they're bold in different ways, not in the way that the world wants to see them. So how do we put these two together? That's the challenge we have here, Mark. But I promise you, I promise you that you will see more and more women from Africa as from next year. So that's the promise to you. And thank you so much, Mark, for all your contribution. Thank you to Rita, Margaret, uh, Margaret uh, and many of you that I see here on the comments that I cannot read all your comments. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Eleanor, how can we find you? If we want to work with you, where do we find you? You are so far away. <laughs> Thank you. So a couple places. Um, we have a show, Fierce Fe the Fierce Feminine Leadership Podcast, the um, success podcast for ambitious women in business. So you can find Fierce Feminine Leadership on iTunes, on Stitcher, on SoundCloud, on Google Play. Um, so you can go ahead and check out the podcast. And of course, there's lots of great resources there. And then the, the next best place is to head over to eleanorbeaton.com. Yeah, yeah. I saw your, I think it's uh, an event you had recently. Mm -hmm. I sent it, I sent the video to a lady in Nigeria and she's, she's, she's really, oh, how can we find her? Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, we have another event coming up in um, in Arizona in Great. March. Yeah, so definitely it's, um, you know, we have so many resources to support women. And, and thank you so much for 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 sharing, for inviting me on your platform and giving me this opportunity to connect with your audience, Lillian. I really appreciate it. And, you know, the work that you're doing out in the world and so many of the women that we heard of from here is so incredibly valuable. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. I know my audience will love you. We would 
have you in Africa. We would love, love, you to, love to have you as a keynote speaker. But please, before that happens, do share with us any events you might have. There are women in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Rwanda who would need somebody, in Kenya who need somebody like you. Thank so you. Share with us what, uh, what your event is about and when it's taking place so mm. we can then share with other women. And Absolutely. It's called Your Million Dollar Message. Find your voice, craft your strategy, change the world. It takes okay. place March 23rd to 25th in Scottsdale, Arizona. And you can learn more about it by going to your million dollar message retreat.com or just sending us an email. Um, you can reach out to my um, operations manager, Kelly at eleanorbeaton.com. Great. Thank you so much for your time. You are most welcome. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. So, thank you all for watching. It was a pleasure speaking with Eleanor. Thank you for all your comments and talk to you on Friday. Bye-bye.